Manish, you have sent it? Yeah, Sorry? I have sent it. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I just got it. Uh, Zoom lecture meeting. So you want me to uh, only uh, this thing, no? Uh, put up the PPT. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Resume. No, no, resume uh, only the PPT. Yeah, okay. Uh, I think so. Mandar has just, uh, uh, it's live on YouTube. So now whatever we say will be shown on uh, YouTube. We have about 41 people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I have not shared the link with them. Huh? So I think only those who are uh, right now on the YouTube channel would be able yes, to see. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Just give me a few minutes, I'm trying to load it. I'll have to log off for a few seconds. I'll just join back in. Just give me two, two, three minutes. Yeah. Mandar. Hmm. I should should I share him on share on the screen because I, I I could I could succeed. No, now you can send me on WhatsApp. I'll talk on WhatsApp. We are already 1056, 1058, sorry. Yeah, Ganesh, I think you should share it because... I think I'll do it. Let uh, Samir... Uh, yeah, anyway, questions it. in chat box, we can manage. Yeah, 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 I can take it from the... On, on WhatsApp if Mandar can share it with me. I'm doing that. Huh? Anyway, questions after the presentation. So the presentation can be closed after that. Yeah. Great. Just have to make it a little bigger. Okay. Done. We are ready. Excellent. Mandal. Yes. Yes. Manish. Letting in people now. No problem. Should I start? Yeah. Start letting in people. We'll start, and then you just see mute all of them, hmm. and then uh, I'll mute, uh, uh, unmute myself. Hmm. Start letting in people. We we'll start in about a minute time or so. Mr. Vaitishwaran, are you uh, set? Can, uh, can yeah, I start? Yeah, please, yeah. Yeah. Yes, please. I'll start now. And my voice is audible no? now, uh, uh, Mandar. Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes.
Well, friends, a uh, very good morning to all our members and all our online participants, and also a very warm welcome on this uh, to this virtual meeting on uh, taxation of digital economy. I, on behalf of all of us and on behalf of the Bombay Chartered Accountant Society, would also welcome our learned speaker and a close friend of our society, Advocate Vaitishwaranji from Chennai. Welcome, sir. I would also like to extend a sincere thanks to him for agreeing to being with us, sparing his time and agreeing to address us today. I also acknowledge the presence of our secretaries, Meer Sheth and Samir Kapadia, and our two managing committee members, Ganesh Rajgopalan and Mandar Telang, who will be playing host to this online Zoom meeting. Friends, over the past seven decades, Hello. Hello, am I audible? Yes, Manish, you are. Hello, can, can you hear me? Hello. Hello. Yes, Manish. we can. Yeah. Yes, you Friends, are. over the past seven decades, the Bombay Chartered Accountant Society has been disseminating knowledge to its members and community at large. And since years, our unique selling point has always been our events, be it lecture meeting, seminars, workshop, residential courses, or long duration courses, and our publications. We have never ventured out on an online platform in a big way until recently when we were forced to do it. But friends, I'm happy and proud to inform you that the Bombay Chartered Accountant Society has taken up this challenge and handsomely converted this into a opportunity. And we have changed the way in which we are disseminating our knowledge and our reach to our members. We have gone online. Friends, I'm also happy to inform you that during this phase of lockdown, we have successfully organized more than 30 online such events and our live viewership has been 20,000 views on this 30 program. And as we are speaking today, as on date, uh, we have a viewership of 36,000 on our YouTube channel and all other platforms. Resulting, if you take an average of about two hours per lecture, then resulting almost in a 72,000 man hours of viewership for our online programs. Friends, I uh, often get feedback from members on inquiring how to be in touch with our society and how to be in touch with our programs. So for all of you, I would just request, you know, all of you to follow us on our social media handle, that is BCAS Global, on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube, wherein we regularly post our updates and our forthcoming events, and also visit our website. Friends, I'm also happy to announce that today we have a social media following of about 37,000 people, and we witnessed an increase of almost 2,000 people in the last 10 days. Uh, I also uh, take this opportunity to inform you of our forthcoming event on Saturday morning. We have an expert chat with Mohanda Spy, who will be speaking on the world and India post-COVID. Friends. I would also appeal to all our members who have so far not renewed their membership or journal subscription to do so immediately so that we can continue to benefit from the knowledge enriching activities of the society. Now friends coming to today's topic and speaker for today. Friends, we all know that the whole world has gone digital. The digital economy today is just not restricted only to B2B or B2C transactions over the internet by email, or it is just not restricted to online shopping. There is much more to it. The entire gamut of e-commerce, music, film industry, sports, intellectual property rights, online education and training, online advertisement, sponsorship, and much more all form part of the digital space today. In fact, I was reading this morning uh, today that a famous Bollywood director has roped in a London-based studio to handle the special effects and giving the finishing touches to its much-awaited star-studded upcoming movie, which was shot in five different countries and later on will be released in 18 countries simultaneously. Friends, how do we tax profits from this movie? Uh, slowly, the digital economy is overtaking the traditional economy. And the, to add to the complexities, it is getting tangled. And traditional economy, it's, it's getting difficult to identify and demarcate separately. So taxation of digital economy is becoming a problem. Which juris jurisdiction will tax it? The jurisdiction of consumption of the goods and services or the jurisdiction at the plate of place of supply, or in certain cases where the intellectual property right is situated. To address all these issues, we have a friend, a very close friend of the society, advocate Vaitishwaranji. He heads the practice uh, uh, of K. Vaitishwaran and Company, 
for almost three decades. Uh, Mr. Vaiteshwaran has obtained a law degree from the Madras Law College. He also holds additional qualifications from the Institute of the Cost and Works Accountants of India, and also he's a member of the Institute of the Company Secretaries of India. He also is the head of the Taxation Committee of the Madras Chamber of Commerce and Industry. He's a member of the Tamil Nadu branch of the Committee of the Indo-American Chamber of Commerce. He's the member of the Economic Policy, uh, Economic Policy Advisory Committee of CII Southern Region. Uh, more importantly, friends, he has recently authored a book, a book on digital, uh, on taxation of digital economy, covering the international tax, the, the indirect tax aspects. So we have today, we could not have found a more apt person than Vaiteshwaranji to speak on both the direct and indirect tax aspects of uh, digital uh, uh, economy. Friends, with these words, I hand over the proceedings to Vaiti Shurangi. Sir, the full floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, good morning, all of you. It's it's a pleasure to connect uh, virtually. And uh, it's so nice to see so many friends from BCAS uh, connecting. And uh, normally, we'll have an RRC around this time or probably in uh, a later part of the year. And now we have this virtual meeting where uh, we can share our thoughts. I'm so thankful that the BCS chose this kind of topic at this point of time and uh, called me to speak. Let me share some of my thoughts on this. My presentation would cover virtually three segments. One would be about the digital economy per se. Then look at the direct tax and indirect tax. Direct tax and indirect tax will be interfaced. They'll, they'll be moving from one to another. And then we'll see where we go forward uh, in this segment. Next, please. Ganesh, next. Yeah. So as uh, Manish rightly said, everything has become digital. You know, uh, the whole economy perspective has changed. Internet, as we knew, has completely gone beyond emails. And uh, e-commerce is uh, no longer a terminology which uh, requires to be understood. And uh, if you go back to films, there were days when uh, we had to examine whether a film projector taken to a site and put at the site for the purpose of showing a movie whether the film projector is fixed to the ground and therefore it is immobile property or not. And we had case laws way back in the 20s, 1920s, to say whether the, what is the degree of annexation, what is the object of annexation. So from film and reels, we have moved on much. Moved on to CDs and now we are talking about downloads and live streaming. But what is interesting is that the business is the same. The product or the service is the same. The consumption is the same. The interest is the same. But the mode of delivery has changed. New solutions have come into the picture. So I am a customer in Chennai. I have looked at a portal. I place an order. I find that it belongs to a Cayman Island company. And once the order is placed, that company gives instructions to another company in the US. Then the goods actually get shipped. comes to my house and delivers the goods. Next. Import in India and payment of all applicable customs duties and taxes. The vendor is located outside India and he has supplied goods. Now just because the entire transaction has been digitally enabled, can you say that this transaction is completely different from a normal supply of goods? Had you placed a traditional purchase order and the goods have been supplied from abroad and goods had landed here, would you then take the view that some element of business profits in India should be taxed? Why should we look at digital alone differently is one very key question that has to be answered. Should the same rules of business connection and PE would apply? Or do we need to look at new rules for the purpose of taxation of uh, digital economy? So the, large, the way things go is, would answers be different for digital products and services? Or should answers be even different for products supplied through digital media? Next. The best example which everybody gives about uh, digital economy, in fact, many of the uh, revenue officials have gone, go, uh, have gone on uh, stage to say that we have many of these companies making huge revenues and we want to tax them. And that is why we are looking at all these new kind of levies. So let's look at typically uh, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, or LinkedIn, etc., which are popular on uh, social media. The biggest advantage of all these is that there's no age barrier. 
right from a dadi who is 83 years old to a, to a, to a young uh, to young kid uh, they are all very happy using it they, they have no problem in handling it uh, they are quite active in uh, posting their information and then the tremendous use of the no the interest of the user is unbelievable because we have we are less than in the uh, social media space and therefore there is tremendous amount of interest and then of course there is always you can say sir there is a concept of an informed consent what is an informed consent you will you, you will have to say you will have to let us say you download an application for the purpose of using a particular uh, social media platform unless you say yes to a couple of permissions you cannot go forward and in your interest to go forward and use that application you may give access to so many things which you are not supposed to give access you give access to your data you access to your gallery you give your contacts but if you don't do that you will not be able to enjoy the full effect of that uh, particular application so it's a very tricky one you, you want to use the application you have to say yes to so many things so if you say no then you can't use the application the problem is that there is no significant privacy laws data privacy laws don't exist in india but of course we are going towards that we have a committee sri krishna committee which has recommended certain guidelines and legislation is likely and the whole beauty of the social media is that the customers voluntarily come forward and provide massive data free of cost the customer is is, is actually the data provider and then the, the so the companies decided that this kind of data can be analyzed technology has emerged and based on data analytics they could find out that we can actually do a target advertising so let us give an example of somebody in um, in the pre covid scenario of somebody in mumbai getting transferred to chennai and uh, he's come on a promotion so he comes to chennai on a promotion and he posts on his all his social media accounts saying, or something like that now this data would be definitely looked at and analytics would happen and then in the next few hours or probably minutes you get ads about uh, property near chennai for him to lease or buy and uh, other uh, gadgets etc would now be available for him because they know that he is really quoting and he has to buy so many things and if, if he if he even searches something in in google for uh, for a refrigerator of a particular type he will get flooded with messages in facebook and then there'll be an sms saying that uh, you need this to buy look at this particular product so everything is connected it's a connected world whereby the search engine is connected the social media is connected your device is connected and therefore there is every possibility of simple data that is keyed in in your device will have all this is that advertising has become a science and free access is the key next so, mr vaidishwaran you are going yeah. off you are going off mute and then you are coming back on i don't know why uh, no, I'm quite close to the camp uh, audio. No, you're getting, you're going mute, and then you are, you're getting unmuted on your own. How it is happening, I don't know. I this uh, Just, button. Yeah, please alone. check. Yeah. Uh, please see that you don't press any mute button. Yeah, I'm not pressing anything. Next okay, time. let's yeah, let's go ahead. Yeah, please. Yeah. The next one is uh, in the context of. Uh, can you move it? Next slide, please. I am now unmuted. Next slide. The next slide, please. Ganesh, can you hear me? Ganesh. Yeah. Let me give an example of a company which is headquartered in Ireland. The customer data in India is analyzed. Patterns emerge. and then information is sold to advertising companies and vendors of goods and services this is typical one which government keeps talking about now the key question is can you say that creation of a market in india creates a taxable presence or can you say that profits which arise out of sale of data generate can be taxed in market jurisdiction so what is the role of a market jurisdiction does the market jurisdiction gets a right to tax it because of the fact that there is a market that is created in that jurisdiction and therefore they have a right or you can say that the data was generated in that market and therefore profits arising out of sale of data belongs to that jurisdiction or some portion of it belongs to that jurisdiction next please i would say that the, the better phrase would be a borderless economy because digital economy seems to ring fence certain transactions which what oecd keeps saying that we don't want to ring fence certain transactions economy across all sectors have moved towards digitization and the beauty of that is that business now happens sans physical presence 
There is no change in the customer, no change in consumption, but business still happens. So now governments are saying that, look, we are seeing laws of tax revenues because traditionally we go by the PE and we go by the existence of a PE. And if business can happen without the requirement of a physical presence, how do we get our revenues? So across the world, countries have said we want more revenue from these kind of businesses. Next. In fact, this is a terminology which is uh, coined by one of my juniors. Digital twin is now the reality after COVID because COVID has taught us many things. One, of course, to stay at home. The other is that how to continue your overall activities which we are normally doing without the help of a digital world. So now you have a digital twin. Whatever is possible, to the large extent, whatever is possible in the physical world is now being mirrored and mimicked by the digital world. And social distancing has forced you to stay at, to use at this technology, use at this particular process, whether it is professional or business, everybody is now saying, can we do business as usual? One can now work without actually going to work. Just imagine if this pandemic had surfaced about two decades ago, we would have been in much more severe uh, pressure because we didn't, we, didn't have, we didn't have this kind of technology. We didn't have this kind of uh, support. We didn't have this kind of alternatives. But now everything exists. Everything you can think of, there is a matching digital twin. So you can now do whatever is possible before with the digital presence. And going forward, every sector would start embracing work from home. They look, look at cloud as a very big option. They look, so the SaaS would become popular, MHTEP would become popular. Earlier, it was confined to certain sectors. Now, beyond these sectors, every other, system, every other sector will now see how to do business using all these things. So we are well and truly into the digital age. And in my view, everything will change. And we have this is a time to embrace that change. This will be the new norm, completely new normal will start post this. Next. Let's look at some segments where you'll have this impact. Let's look at education and training. Many of you have uh, children at home who are now clued on to the uh, iPad or the laptop or with uh, uh, speakers on uh, chatting to their uh, teachers. Some teachers continue lecture after lecture because traditional classrooms are now getting to online courses. Colleges will have to reinvent and campus education will become irrelevant. Exam halls would again be relevant because social distancing is difficult exam halls. So you'll have online, online examinations. This, ex, this seminar is a classic example. Seminar versus virtual seminars. Obviously, these kind of things will happen. From a, from a sadness perspective, school children can no longer look out for rain holidays. You cannot say that rain is there, I can't go to school. You better stay at home and still be at school. Business and profession, even manufacturing sectors that requires physical presence will move towards automation and robotics. So how much of social distancing can you implement in manufacturing sector? There could be certain activities which are so connected that you cannot implement social distancing in the shop floor. And therefore, they look at next solution. Can I automate it? Can I look at robotics? And look at the other segments in manufacturing, your accounting, your audit, your business support, your design, your marketing support, your back office, all will move to work from post. So then you may even say that there will be some activities that require a physical presence. Yes, there will be some element. In fact, there was some data about TCS, new item about TCS as to what is their plan for the next five years and how they would like to move towards uh, nearly 75% would move towards uh, work from home. So new tech solutions will emerge every day, every hour to avoid the physical. Next. Healthcare, app-based services will happen. You'll have doctors speaking online. You'll have doctors examining you online and giving advisory and consultancy. You already have drone uh, ambulances in the UAE. In entertainment and shopping, probably the founding members of digital economy, many of you know that your children at home they, they're still playing games. They, they, they are the best to look at as to how they embrace technology. Earlier when they were looking at uh, calling their friends home and sitting on a game of Ludo, now they're playing the same game of Ludo online. All of them seem to be very happy playing this particular game of Ludo. And uh, earlier they used to go out as friends and watch a movie. Now they do what is called as uh, sharing. Netflix they watch together and there's a chat box while they watch the movie. So children can completely give us examples as to how they adapt. And we probably have to learn more from them in terms of how we go forward. COVID has completely accelerated the shift to a digitally sourced business. And in fact, OECD in 2020 has made a very interesting observation. The world economy and societies are going through a digital transformation that goes well beyond computerization and use of information and telecommunication technologies. This transformation is creating opportunities and challenges for all levels of government in the area of tax and expenditure policy and administration, service delivery, fiscal financial management, and regulatory practices and policies. Next. So this was published in 2019, where the OECD talked about a digital ecosystem and talked about what all constitutes a digital ecosystem. If you look at it, there is a computing power, there is IoT, there is 5G networks, there is blockchain, there is AI, there is big data, there is cloud computing. Next. 
ai in action is you know very well known people now look at uh, these things in much more easier acceptance self driving cars is a classic example of tesla and all of us are quite used to the digital assistance assistance uh, right from your morning you have your wake up call is through your alexa and uh, your entire uh, day starts digital your siri alexa pixie translate gps google lens google measure everything is all being used professional services we have ibm watson ross intelligence in fact some years uh, a year ago i had to make a presentation somewhere to one of the uh, consulting firms on where would uh, professional services be in 2025 and where would litigation be in 2025 so i had made certain uh, thought process and uh, predictions and uh, i'm quite uh, i'm quite clear that it won't be till 2025 it will be much earlier the entire digital journey will be so accelerated because of covid healthcare as i already talked about security is big will be through all this face recognition biometric traffic everything will go through this uh, mechanism of ai using ai and of course social media next fintech we all know how the stock market behaves through algorithms and verification manufacturer will become big right now uh, people are talking about how quickly we can manufacture ventilators or products related to ventilators using 3d printers and uh, robotics this would now increase many fold because there is an urgency to get products urgency to get things done there will be lot of uh, ai in action in, in uh, manufacturing segment defense of course will go through autonomous weapons and space we already have a fedor which is a russian humanoid robot to replicate the movements of the operator and perform certain actions autom autonomously next so what is critical for ai is data you know ai can be effective unless it has got access to massive data now that is the biggest challenge in ai many companies jump into ai for the sake of jumping into ai you have to be very very careful if you don't have access to data if you are not in a position to ma have massive data which you can put in the data lake and then analyze it and pick out something relevant you are in trouble google has the biggest private data data is generated through multiple devices today all of us generate data as we go and uh, the prediction is that 127 new devices are connected to the internet every second and mobile device usage which was 4 billion in 2013 is projected to 6 billion in 2020 i doubt if 6 billion in 2020 is is uh, will be correct it will be much much more because post covid these numbers will again go up next so many of us know this we have this phone and uh, we are so used to what all we have in the phone but if you try to analyze what all you have you have an iris sensor your fingerprint sensor your heart rate sensor your pressure sensor you name it you have everything and all this computes data all this sends back data to wherever possible and then that data is managed analyzed etc next so how does iot work this will be a little technical but it's still worth while to look at it the sensors and actuators collect the inputs and then the whole thing is digitized and placed on networks and then it will be processed using hardware software and its analytics and provided to users so basically this is what uh, the tax authorities are looking at the processed data the processed data is sold to somebody so but how does the process start you will collect all kinds of data irrelevant data or well, just imagine a situation in a, in a traffic zone uh, you are on a road where there is a webcam which completely records the traffic now it will record every day's traffic normally what is supposed to record is probably breaches and things like that but it will record everything so what you are having is going to have multiple voluminous data and then this has to be digitized and placed and then analyzed and processed so based on this data some kind of solutions will be created and that is how we now have uh, solutions for the home we have lighting which is automatic we have lock which are automatic we have echo which has got a voice which is better than us we have got connected cars imagine what could happen in terms of uh, driving and preventive maintenance your car will be able to communicate to the uh, uh, the owner that a particular part in the car requires maintenance or it will simultaneously communicate to the vendor that he may have to replace it Let, let's look at wearable devices there are there are companies which say that uh, you connect your wearable device to a website and so that since you are regularly walking we know your health data and based on that you will get some kind of discounts in your policy in the next premium but you also have to know that data will also indicate what kind of premium should be charged for this kind of uh, patient or a person healthcare we are now moving towards diabetic retinopathy retail many of you know how the analytics is so critical in fact retail is the one that is being big time affected by uh, this covid but post covid uh, retail therapy will happen as people say when you're depressed you go shopping so i believe retail will jump back slowly and uh, steadily that will be the first one to jump back and look at the target story this many of you would know that uh, one uh, father got a message from uh, one of the uh, multi chain shops saying that uh, your daughter is pregnant now he was furious and he got shocked 
and he sent a shocking email to the uh, company saying that how dare you say all these things and the company said that it's extremely sorry what you're doing we'll apologize we'll our uh, topmost person will come and meet you and apologize few days later the father called back and said it's my turn to apologize she is indeed pregnant now how did target find out target apparently had analytics to say who all pick up what products in the shop and based on the there was a predictive mechanism saying that if you pick a b c then you are probably uh, pregnant so look at how analytics can be used in terms of uh, in terms of retail in terms of business real time logistics agriculture we have phenomenal usage uh, as far as ai is concerned predictions are also possible next so this is a typical it example which many would give saying that uh, the milk carton would tell you that it is empty please it's time to buy milk of course i i used to ask my friend saying that imagine if somebody is able to hack it and uh, what what will happen if the milk carton decides to order a refrigerator how do you prevent it and you and your payment uh, wallet is used to debit for a refrigerator next now i'll go on to the tax aspects this is a famous observation of justice jagannath rao in vishakhapatnam court which is the basis for most of the decisions on pe where the api court said the permanent establishment postulates the existence of a substantial element of an enduring or permanent nature of a foreign enterprise in another country which can be attributed to a fixed place of business in that country so what was critical there was they said that it must be of such a nature that would amount to a virtual projection of the foreign enterprise of one country into the soil of another country so they're talking about virtual projection even though when they used the word virtual in 1983 they probably did not have the advantage of technology or virtual but they used the word virtual projection at that point of time to indicate that there is something kind of telescope into another jurisdiction and that would get the right uh, for the that jurisdiction to tax it next then the very famous formula 1 world championship uh, decision now what happened here was many of you know this case law where the uh, there was a booth international circuit which was made available to that particular company to conduct that particular race in india and the supreme court said that it is clearly a fixed place where the commercial or economic activity of conducting f1 was carried out one could clearly discern that it was a virtual projection of the foreign enterprise namely formula 1 on the soil of this country now what is the effect of formula 1 decision all of us know no for from after formula 1 it's unlikely that any race can happen in india because nobody wants to take a tax position sometimes we wonder whether uh, some aggressive tax position by the by the revenue can have a dust a disastrous consequence on future economic activity of the country we, like how we decided that uh, mauritius could be a route for some point for growth we should probably take a breather and not look at every transaction and see if everything can be taxed if everything can be taxed then india india is not the only country which is inventing this the formula 1 takes place across the world are all countries desiring to take this route of calling it as a pe but once you start taking their position and is litigated then the courts will have to decide based on what is presented what is argued and once a president comes in it affects everybody else so but what was critical in this judgment is that supreme court made on uh, went on to observe that a pe must have three characteristics namely stability productivity and dependence next now let me look at some of the case laws which touch the digital economy and then move on to some of the new levies that have come this was this famous case law where the assessee was a florist and he used advertising on search engines by google and yahoo and for that obviously he wanted to generate business and obviously was making payments in respect of these online advertising to google ireland and yahoo usa and the tax department took a view that you should have done tax deduction because the income of the non resident was taxable in india next the kolkata bench in the case called as right florist made some interesting observation they said that the traditional concept of pe which was conceived at a point of time when internet and e-commerce was not even on the radar does not really fit into modern day world in which virtual presence through internet in certain aspects is as effective as physical presence for carrying on business next more critically observation in the context of website while website per se is a combination of software and electronic data does not constitute tangible property as it cannot have a location which constitutes a place of business a web server on which the website is stored and through which it is accessible is a piece of equipment having a physical location and such location may constitute a fixed place of business and therefore they said a search of a search engine may not be very relevant but if it is located in a web server and the web server is located in that jurisdiction yes it can constitute a pe 
And on facts, they said in the instant case, web servers are not located in India, and hence there is no PE. Now, what happens if laws change? What happens if local laws mandate that the servers will have to be located in the same, same jurisdiction? You have this uh, RBI directive in the context of financial transactions. We have uh, the agreements between uh, US and Japan in the context of uh, partial trans-Pacific agreements, where where should data locate in terms of financial transactions? So can there be such laws can be a bigger question. But if such laws do exist, then you will be forced to locate a web server in a particular jurisdiction. And if you, if you do that, you may probably create a PE based on this decision. Next. Somebody was accessing a website. Access was given on payment of subscription. Permissions were granted. Yes, you can use the name, confidential name, and password. You can enter the restricted areas. You can navigate. You can move around. You're also allowed to download permitted content and to reproduce the same in storage media as permitted computer copies. Next. These facts, Delhi Bench, in the case of ONGC Videsh, held that totality of facts indicated that information and knowledge available to the SSE was made through a license and therefore it falls under royalty. So there is always a twin thought process. Can I call it, a, can I link it through a P or can I say that there is some kind of an access which falls in the ambit of royalty and therefore can I still ask for withholding? Next. A Singapore entity provided social media monitoring services. This is more important today because a social media can completely bring down a company in terms of negative news and uh, what can go wrong with an organization. So there was an entity which was simply monitoring the, the uh, social media activity and it was obviously on subscription basis. The AR in the case of Thoughtbus ruled that the same would take the character of royalty as defined in the explanation to section 916 and in terms of article 12 between India and Singapore. Next. A very interesting question came before the European Court of Justice. Can you say that lending of a printed book is the same as lending of a digital copy of a book? And then the uh, European Court of Justice said that lending within the meaning of these provisions covers lending of a digital copy of a book. And therefore, they said there is no difference between lending of books and it will also include digital lending. Next. Now we come to this famous Google decision, a little bit of factual analysis. Company was engaged in the business of digital advertising and internet marketing and use internet search engines such as Google Yahoo to buy ad space. The officers were of the view that it attracted withholding since services by Google Island was the nature of technical services. Next. Before we go into Google, in Pinstrom, it was very clearly held that amount paid by the Apple to Google Island for the services rendered for uploading display of banner was not in the nature of business profit and in the absence of any PE. There is no question of tax. So it's very clear that what you make as a payment towards uh, data or an advertisement or online advertisement, etc., that cannot get taxed because the foreign company receiving it, it's a business activity. They did not have any kind of PE in India. So Pinstrom was a well-established principle and it was, it was hoped that that uh, prevailed. But next, Google took a completely different view. In fact, if you read Google decision in which came out from Bangalore 8080, you will sometimes wonder whether we need to even debate uh, taxation of digital economy and whether the WIPs, WEPS Action Plan 1 and OECD discussions are completely irrelevant because whatever is talked about as future taxation is already covered in terms of the Bangalore ITAD decision. Next. Factually, you had a Google India Private Limited, wholly owned subsidiary of Google International uh, LLC. GIPL was engaged in the business of providing IT and ITES services. GIPL was a distributor of the AdWord programs in India. It's the most popular program of Google. And under the agreement, GIPL was granted the marketing and distribution rights of this program to advertisers in India and was remunerated on a cost plus model. Next. Now, what does this ad program do? It's a fantastic program where what the advertiser gets is that he gets an access to the tools of this program, which allows choice of time, season, etc., for the ads to be shown. So the targeted advertising takes a very different dimension. It is completely focused. And because of this focus advertisement, there is more attention, there is significant engagement, there is significant conversion into transactions or business. And all this is possible on account of the network, the access to the tools of the search engine and the Google Analytics, which is working in the backend. So Google search engine had access to information and data pertaining to every aspect of the user, such as name, sex, city, state, country, phone number, religion as well as access to the history of the user and behavior of the person. And because Google searching had this access, the advertiser also had access to the analytics program through the Apple. 
And therefore, based on this, there were doubts as to whether this can be taxed. Next. So what the court, the tribunal said is that it's a complex program or it can be called as a portal or software developed by Inc. And the appellant while discharging the obligation of the said program has access to trademarks, IPR, derivative works, brand works, and content information. It's a long jump from the facts, but that's how they jumped. Payment made with the appellant to Google India was not as simple as the payment for purchase of AdWords space. And they said that it is a payment of royalty and in terms of section 916 as an income deemed to accrue as in India. And one of the arguments put forth was there is already an equalization levy by Finance Act 2016. The tribunal said that does not affect the kind of services and this would not convert the nature of payment made by the appellant. Next. Now I've gone through this decision in full. I have a couple of questions. This probably is the point of debate which all professionals can engage in terms of Google. Can you really say that the payments for purchase of a digital advertisement space amounts to a payment by way of a royalty? Now, how is it so different if you purchase the same advertisement space or slot in a print media? The whole objective advertisement, whether in the print or digital, is to ensure that your product gets awareness and you get a customer or you convert a, an interest into a transaction. So can you say that print and media and digital media, there is no difference? So if print media does not confer rights, can there be special rights which are getting conferred in the digital media? That's a very important question. Now, going back in service tax, when at a point of time when service tax was being levied across different categories in terms of uh, defining each categories, the usage of IPR was identified as a separate service, whereas sale of advertising space was always identified as a separate service. So both were recognized as distinct services. And sale of advertisement space also include online advertisement. So if advertisement space sale was identified as a simple service species, how did it suddenly become a right to use an IPR or a brand and therefore access to a brand and therefore the payment is a nature of oil? So this is an important question that probably will have to be debated as this matter goes up at the, at the higher forums. Next. The second question in the, in the context of Google is that, can an interpretation based on domestic law run completely counter to treaty provisions? Many of you would be aware of this decision of the AP High Court in Sanofi Bastard, but it's a fantastic judgment to read in full. It's a lengthy one. But where the uh, Justice Goda Raghuram has very clearly said that the principles of treaty override is very, very important. And how many retrospect amendments you bring into the act does not make any sense unless you are fortified by a non extant clause expressed to override tax treaties. So you would have seen any number of amendments to Section 916. You would have had explanation running up to other. In fact, we had this beautiful retrospect amendment up to 1962 where in the context of transponders, they decided to tax it from 62, even though satellites did not exist in the 60s. But anyway, whatever may be the case, the interesting point in the AP High Court is, yes, you have amended Section 9, but is it enough? Have you overridden Section 90? Have you said that the amendment is such that it overrides everything else? If you have not done so, then domestic law change cannot override what is called as the Treaty Supremacy. Next. The third important question in Google case is that whether a selling of ad space in a website is very different from a provision of a mere service. You have to look at Sky Cell version of the Madras High Court, where the Madras High Court brought a distinction between a technical service and a mere service and said that payments made towards the same as a mere collection of a fee or use of a facility provided to who are all willing to pay for it, it does not amount to a fee received for technical services. So what he does, the customer, is that he agrees to pay for the use of the airtime and therefore, that is not in the nature of technical fees. Now, what a person agrees when he goes to an online advertisement is that he identifies a particular slot, a particular time, he is able to get that. Okay, it is more effective. For example, if you look at, uh, uh, you engage an ad agency, when they design an advertisement for you, they know exactly what kind of uh, requirements of your product are and how it has to be uh, effective. Or you go to an agency for the purpose of billboards, they will tell you which billboards are ideal because this is where maximum traffic is there. This is where people have to look up. They're so bored from their cars, therefore they look outside and therefore they will see it. Now that is the modern version of uh, targeted advertising. So what was physically known as targeted advertising in flyovers is now targeted advertising in the digital space. So is it so different that we have to treat it differently and bring all kinds of laws to tax it? Next. Now I'll move on to a same tax case law in, in from the US Supreme Court. So basically, just like how uh, the jurisdictions were clamoring for direct taxes, in the US, states were clamoring for sales taxes. 
and the state of south dakota required uh, discovered that many people from outside their states were able to do phenomenal business in their state without a presence they did not have a place of business they did not have an office they did not have a warehouse but through the website through the internet they were able to have successful business in their state and therefore they wanted to have to levy tax on that many of you who have gone to us would have noticed that uh, sales tax differ, differs in us state wise some states have it some states don't have it some states have a very lower rate of tax for example in boston the the use tax is quite high and therefore many people will take the car and move out of uh, the state and go to the neighboring state new hampshire and then buy something and come back because there is uh, exemption or cheap rates as far as tax is concerned so very very common so there was a law that was made saying that even if you had a if you don't have a physical presence you'll be deemed to have a physical presence in the state of south dakota if you have delivered more than usd 1 lakh of goods and services into that state or you have engaged in 200 or more separate transactions now this provision was questioned on the ground that it affects businesses it affects interstate supply and therefore this went up to the the south dakota supreme court where they said these provisions are not valid then went up to supreme court us supreme court where they reversed the south dakota judgment and said that this provision imposed by south dakota is completely valid and they said that the physical presence rule which was given by the us supreme court in quill is no longer relevant it is unsound and incorrect because they said quill creates market distortions in fact they made a beautiful observation by saying that quill did not have before it the present realities of interstate marketplace where the internet's prevalence and power have changed the dynamics of national economy so what followed the decision of the us supreme court in south dakota next many other states had similar laws washington california texas louisiana virginia massachusetts ohio new york all have similar provisions to create nexus based on transactions or based on users or a combination of both and then a question arose as to whether this wayfair ruling will have a retrospective effect or a prospective effect and therefore now there is a there is a thought process as to how to make it prospective through a legislation and going forward there is also a new legislation in the us called as digital goods and service taxes where they're going to create a nexus through a customer tax address and make the responsibility on the seller to pay the sales tax or the use tax next now moving to the indirect tax actually again i'll come back to that tax a bit later we have something similar in uh, gst and this was a, this was a this was a legacy which we borrowed from service tax we just continued this what is called as oidar oidar is nothing but online information database access or retrieval services it's a brilliant definition sometimes you wonder as to you know how much of interpretation you can do on this because delivery has to be mediated by information technology it has to be done over the internet or electronic network and the nature of it is such that the entire supply is automated or even if it is involving human intervention it is very minimum and it is impossible to ensure in the absence of technology brilliant so this kind of talked about what is called as online information database access and then they got worried as to whether we should be have made it clear or not and therefore they said and includes so this is a typical way of defining things and not only is it includes we also put examples as to what is electronic services so they decided to put advertising on the internet so advertising on the internet finds place in this angle providing cloud service providing cloud services provision of ebooks movie music software intangibles through network or internet providing data information retrieval otherwise to any person online supplies of digital content movie tv show music and the like digital data storage and online game so you look at it the entire digital economy is brought into this platform by calling it as online information database access and retrieval services next so what happens if it is online database so first key question would be to find out what is the place of supply for the purpose of taxation now there is again an interesting definition in terms of section 1312 where they say that the place of supply for oidr services shall be the location of the recipient and then they say person receiving services shall be deemed to be located in the taxable territory if any two of the following non contradictory conditions are satisfied So let us say I, I am a customer in India placing an order through OIDR. Then I would have given a address through internet. If the internet address is in India, well, I finished the first condition. I am using a credit card and it has been issued in the taxable territory. Another condition is satisfied. My billing address is here. Possible satisfaction. My IP address. This is the one that is borrowed in income tax for equal exchange levy. The internet protocol address of the device is in the taxable territory. bank account is in the taxable territory sim card is in the taxable territory fixed landline is in the taxable so any of this i will fulfill 
So any transaction of OADR, I may easily trigger two of these conditions. And once two of these conditions are triggered, then the person receiving such services shall be deemed to be located in the taxable territory. Fine. What follows next? We have to look at this from two angles. Is it an import of service? Now, if the supplier is located outside India and the recipient is located in India, we have this deeming definition where the recipient is located in India and the place of supply is in India, then what they say is, let's look at two situations. Who is the recipient of the service? If the service is being provided by somebody who is outside India, non-taxable territory, and received by a non-taxable online recipient, person other than a non-taxable online recipient, then IGST is payable under reverse charge mechanism. So let us say we, I am a non-taxable online recipient, then straight away I will get out of this ambit of this because the, top, the levy is on the recipient only for other than non-taxable online recipient. So that begs the question, who is a non-taxable online recipient? Next. Some kind of thinking has, been, has, has gone through this. Government, local authority, government authority, individual. Any person not registered and receiving OADR for a purpose other than commerce, industry, business, profession, and located in the tax territory. So they're trying to make a distinction between B2B transactions and B2C transactions in the ambit of OADR. If OADR is happening on a B2B basis, then the recipient pays the GST and the reverse charge mechanism. But if OADR happens on a B2C basis, where the C is an individual or a government or somebody, then the liability is shifted and the liability is technically only on the supplier of services. Next. So they're making very clear through section 14, where OADR is supplied by any person located in a non-taxable territory and received by a non-taxable online recipient, then the supplier has to pay the IGST. And in case the supply is facilitated by an intermediary, then they say, who, what is the role of an intermediary? Does he operate like a principal to principal or he just operates like an agent and brings two parties together? So they give some conditions which are, may not be relevant for our discussion. Next slide. Next slide. So let me give an example. Cacophony International, a partnership firm, it is based in Chennai. It buys music online from an island company. And why does it buy? It wants to buy music content and converts them into karaoke and sells the same in India. Clearly used for business, clearly used for business activities. And therefore, what will happen is that the foreign company which provides these services is required to pay GST. You may ask me a question, how would a foreign company pay GST? For OADR purposes, there is a special mechanism for registration where Bangalore has been identified as a location where any, any company outside India can register and pay this uh, GST. There are more than 300 registrations already obtained and people pay this. Uh, people are supposed to pay GST on this particular transaction. So looking at a foreign company paying GST in India, you're obtaining a registration. Situation two, Mr. Buff Bangalore purchases music to the internet from an island company. Now this is very clearly digital content which is downloaded. This is falling under OADR services, but he's an individual. The moment he is an individual, what happens? The, the happening is that if it is an individual kind of a transaction, it becomes a non-taxable online, that category falls into place. So the supplier becomes liable. If it's a business to business transaction, it is an import of service where the recipient pays the tax. I think I, I shifted the logic in the examples. Let me make it once more very, very clear. Cacophony International is a business entity buying music for the purpose of business. And therefore it is an import of service. Cacophony will pay RCM, GST. In the case of Buff, who is an individual, when he buys for his own purpose and consumption purposes, the foreign supplier has to take a registration in Bangalore. Even if, even if, if it is a Buff Mumbai, he has to take a registration in Bangalore and pay the GST. Now, let's look at CRS services. One of the views that was expressed by the tribunal in, in, uh, in the service tax regime, where they said that the computerized residence, reservation services for airlines, which was provided by Galileo and Amadeus, they said it is OIDAR. Now, if CRS services are provided by Galileo and Imedius, they were considered as OADR, then the recipient is a business entity and therefore it will become an import of service. But let's look at how the same CRS service is looked at from an income tax purpose. CRS was identified as a source of revenue, partially exists in the machines installed in the premises of the subscribers and was held to create a fixed place P in the case of DIT versus Galileo. Of course, there, there was a discussion, discussion as to how much of profits are attributable, but the point was that it was identified as a fixed place P. Now, just imagine a situation where you have a fixed place P in India. 
and you have a registration in there. Now, does it make it a situation where it is no longer under RCM and forward charge comes to that company? That becomes a huge debate. We don't have time for that. We'll go forward. Next. So data becomes so critical. Data, data everywhere. In fact, people used to say that data is a new oil. You know, we, we doubt whether data can be called as a new oil because data is now more powerful and bigger than oil. Oil has lost its significance with time. Nobody expected, nobody in the world believed that oil would have this kind of an impact. But businesses have always used some kind of data. Don't forget the days when uh, somebody, when you're sitting in the afternoon in your house, there'll be a bell which is ringing during your siesta time and you open the door, somebody with a form and a paper asks a question, do you brush your teeth? Of course, I brush my teeth. What toothpaste do you use? This is the toothpaste. How, how, how do you like it? Do you like the flavor? What do you think? And based on the inputs, we change the toothpaste change. We now have salt. We now have so many other things which has come under the toothpaste. So data collection was always there. But data collection was in a very minimum format. Take the case of a taxi ride. Earlier, you used to pick up the phone and book a taxi. Now, at best, what will happen? That man would have a register. He would note down the customer. He would note down the time and date. He will tell the driver to go and pick up. And once the pickup is done, matter is over. But today, the kind of data that a Uber ride or Ola ride would collect is unbelievable. It will collect your location. It will collect your where you're going, when you're going, what is the time, what is the route you have taken, how you have paid, what is your tip given to the driver, what is your relay, what is your conversation happening with the driver if you are recording those conversations in terms of uh, data, what is your complaint mechanism. So much of data is collected across billions and billions of rides. Now, based on this, you can this data can be used for anything. You can predict customer behavior. There are instances where uh, you have food apps which tell you that why did you eat this? And there'll be an, there, there'll be indication that uh, you, you have to eat this even though you'll have something else in your mind. And that something may not be available at that point of time. So, so much of data can be collected and the taxi data could be used for some kind of uh, predictive behavior for automobile sector. With the automobile sector, data can be collected for behavior patterns in, uh, in traffic. The traffic data can be used for transport and transportation reforms and government policies. So, so much of used data can be put into. But the question is, how do you value this data? How does the user even know that he has given data? Who is the owner of data? I've given the data. I've given it involuntarily. When I use an Uber, I have no intention to give all this data. But if I don't give this data, it won't work. Unless you put location, the Uber driver won't come and pick me up. And therefore, I'm giving so much of data. So what will happen in the future? If data privacy laws prohibit usage of data collected for commercial purposes without consent, without informed consent. So my question would be, are social media services really free? When we log on to the Facebook and we're able to use a Facebook or we log on to LinkedIn and use the LinkedIn, why are they giving it free? They're giving it free because they, technically they're giving it free, but probably data is something which you are providing and they are very happy with the kind of data you're able to provide, which they're able to monetize. So the larger question in the future would be, can data become consideration? In fact, uh, if uh, if time permits, you should you should look at my book, which, which has gone in depth into all these aspects as to how you look at uh, data. And uh, thanks to the virtual economy, uh, thanks to the COVID, since bookshops are closed, I had no choice but to next, go to the next dimension very quickly. So the books are now even available in the uh, Amazon in the e-format. Next. Big data is basically raw data, but it has to go to phenomenal analysis and patterns, and then assumptions can be made. Next. So what is the real challenge in taxing this digital economy? Fundamentally, we already talked about this. Markets can be accessed without a physical presence. And the traditional rules are no longer effective. Phenomenal reliance has been placed on intangible and mobile, as and mobile assets. And there is increased avenues for profit shifting. There is every possibility that you can move your profits around depending upon your jurisdiction, your location. In fact, things can even change. Things can even change where if, if a country is a little bit lax in terms of data storage, business could go to that country, particular country. If a country says that uh, servers in my jurisdiction will not be taxed, servers could very well be located in that jurisdiction. So you, you will still have that kind of things happening. Then we'll go back to our old question as to whether this is treaty shopping. What is the principal purpose test? All that will happen again. So with respect to indirect taxes, consumption taxes, firms situated in their point of sale try to locate in a low tax or no tax jurisdiction to minimize VAT JC liability. So the source principle becomes increasingly irrelevant in an increasingly digital age. Next. Now, a very interesting observation, 1923, the League of Nations document on double taxation, which was again quoted by the in the CBDT report. It's a brilliant passage. The oranges upon the trees in California are not acquired wealth until they are picked, and not even at that stage until they are packed, and not even at that stage 
until they are transported to the place where the demand exists and until they are put where the consumer can use them. These stages up to the point where wealth reaches fruition may be shared in by different territorial authorities. This was observation made in 1923. Now, this is what companies are looking at and saying that, look, in the digital economy, the market jurisdiction also has got an equal role to play. That is a place of consumption. That is a place of data location. That is a place of uh, generation of market. Why can't we get a share of taxes? Next. So SEP, what we call a significant economic presence, an explanation was introduced by Finance Act 2018 as to how it will constitute a business connection. And then we had this 2020 uh, Finance Act, which completely substituted the explanation and put a, put a caveat by saying that this is going to happen only from 1-4-2022. So the thought process was, okay, India is going through the same route like the rest of the world. India is aware that the pillar one discussions have not moved forward. They're moving in a particular direction, but consensus is still elusive. Countries are still debating as to how to bring in a mechanism for taxing the digital economy. And therefore, India, which brought its SCP in 2018, decided to pause. And therefore, it is giving significant amount of time up to 1-4-2022 for all these discussions to happen. And probably that seemed to be the logical approach and logical thinking when they said that this explanation is now effective 1-4-2022. And they, and they re refined the definition. They pro reprocessed what was the earlier definition. And they brought in this concept of systematic and continuous soliciting of business activities or engaging transaction number as may prescribed. So they had this prescription methodology for transactions and payments. And then they added that income matter will be taxed. Now let's look at one more angle of SCP. Biggest question in web contracts is that, where do you sign web contracts? When does it become operative? Which country has got jurisdiction? Whether execution of agreement in India is critical. Therefore, this SCP explanation says that transactions shall constitute SCP in India, whether or not. We don't care. You enter the agreement wherever you want. You don't have a place of business in India, doesn't matter. You don't render the service in India, doesn't matter. We can still tax through SCP. Next. Then an interesting, another explanation was added. Explanation 3 cap play was introduced from 1-4-2021. It's very interesting that the main SCP definition in the context of uh, Section 9 is 1-4-22. But then the income attributable definition has now widened by saying that income attributable to operations carried out in India shall include, and look at what all it includes, advertisement which targets a customer who resides in India or a customer who accesses advertisement through IP address located in India. Now, IP address located in India is something which will be very much visible as far as the supplier is concerned. He will definitely see the recipient's address or the IP address which is available. Now, what happens is that this explanation says an advertisement which is going to target a customer who resides in India. So, whatever income you get from that advertisement, you want to look at attribution. And then, you're collecting a lot of data from a person who resides in India and he accesses through an IP located in India. You sell that data. That is also income. We want to look at it. And then, from the data collected, you're using, you're making sale of books or services to a person who resides in India or to a person who used IP located in India, that also we want to bring it in the ambit of uh, income attribution. So what is income attributable to operations carried in India is no longer referred to a percentage formula through tribal judgments. We had enough tribal judgments and what is income attribute? They try to very specifically say that these are the elements which will get captured in the uh, attribution element. Next. But SCP... India jumped into SCP, but OECP seems to OECD seems to kind of move away from SCP, except for recognizing that SCP is one of the factors. They recognize SCP, yes, yes, significant economic presence, transactions, payments are all relevant for recognizing taxing rights. But beyond that, they don't give that much of significance for SCP. They go into a different formula, which I'll discuss a bit later. But SCP is not a criteria in any of the DTAs which we have executed. Treaty supremacy is still there. Absence of treaty override in domestic law amendment is again critical. What we discussed in Sanafi Pascal case will apply even to any all these explanations. The only challenge would be what happens if GAR is invoked. If GAR is invoked, then section 92A can come into the picture. So that becomes a very critical question as to what is the difference between a company which is born digital and a company which becomes digital. So can you say that my very nature of business is digital and therefore my location or my doing this business without having a presence is not something which can fall in the ambit of GAR. It is my natural way of doing business. Or somebody can say, look, I have become digital because there's a calling of times. 
covid has forced me to avoid uh, social distancing covid has forced me to uh, abhor physical interaction and therefore i become digital because it's a calling of times if i'm becoming digital because it's a calling of times then can you say that gar can still apply so that's a very very interesting question and can ppt be applied to a state to state that business has become digital only to avoid taxes or can you say digital was a natural corollary natural transformation therefore my prediction is that litigation is likely to explode in this space as far as uh, taxability is concerned next it is not as if india is the only country india is the first country in 2016 when they adopted uh, uh, equalization levy but as far as scp is concerned israel brought it in their own domestic law italy has got a levy on digital transactions every country has got their own digital taxes or proposals and of course other countries have tried to look at large multinational firms with their own uh, divided profit tax or uh, beat as in us could go got more challenges gafa and france they are all by by itself huge uh, similar topics next let me go on to the another attempt to tax the digital economy which is the equalization levy pillar 1 did said that you can take some temporary measures therefore the unilateral measure india again was the first to impose equalization levy 160 to 170 of finance act 2017 but it was only one service namely online advertising and that too through withholding mechanism next nobody expected this out of the blue while you are sitting in covid while you are at your home hoping for relaxations in terms of existing tax provisions while you are hold hoping that some of the new provision reduce will be deferred and uh, dates would be uh, postponed to another date you suddenly find that the bill stage did not carry this but the bill when it was moved for an amendment had a sudden provision in a matter of 7 days between 23rd march to april 1st you have a new law and that is section 165a with what for effect on 14 2020 it's a mind boggling provision equalization levy at 2% okay on what on the amount of consideration for what consideration received or receivable by an e-commerce operator from e-commerce supplier or services made or provided or facilitated by it fine the e-commerce operator makes a supply or he facilitates a supply to whom to somebody resident in india and to a non resident under certain circumstances or to a person who buys such goods or services of both using internet protocol address located in india it's finished every single e-commerce supply transaction which is going to be affected by a non resident would be brought within the ambit of equalization levy and the language is very wide language is ambiguous it's got a lot of issues i'll explain in next few slides next <coughs> e-commerce operator is very widely defined a non resident who owns or operates or manages digital electronic facility or platform for online sale of goods and they're saying e-commerce supply would cover online sale of goods owned by an e-commerce operator online provision of services by that same guy or he even facilitates an online supply of goods so a platform that is used for a, a physical supply of goods is sought to be identified as an e-commerce supply just because a platform was used next this is in the context of non resident to non resident where they try to say that even under circumstances you can get taxed whereby if an advertisement is sold which targets a customer who happens to be a resident in india or a customer who accesses the advertisement through an ip address located in india then also e-commerce is taxed or if you sell data from a person who is resident in india or a person who uses ip in india we can tax it imagine the impact and scope of all these provisions so this amendment and there is interestingly if you go back to equalization levy in the past along with the first version of equalization levy we had section 10 within bracket 50 which provided for an exemption if you pay equalization levy but now that exemption has been amended by saying it also not only covers the old uh, equalization levy it also covers an arising from any e-commerce supply or services made or provided on or after 1st day of april 2021 so the chargeability comes from 1420 but the exemption from an income tax perspective comes only from 1421 next there are very few exceptions the exceptions is that if you have a pe obviously we'll look at the pe and see what is attributable or if your turnover is less than 2 crores during the preceding financial year or there is an online there is a levy which already exists equal a levy already exists so what are the challenges now every e-commerce supplier has to break their head to find out who is a resident in india and then when he deals with non resident to another non resident transaction he has to visualize what are those specific circumstances and then he has to look at every purchaser and look at whether ip address has been triggered from india very very wide in scope and as i said the chargeability comes in one year but the exemption comes in the next year but let us imagine that somebody is taxable there is a foreign company which provides an e-commerce supply they are liable to pay tax how will you enforce it 
whether you have jurisdiction to go behind that but particular company and issue notice and tax it and what will happen you will probably go by the big uh, names but there will be tremendous fragmentation there will be smaller companies may do this and then the levy is on consideration that brings its own issues as to what would constitute consideration next let's imagine the situation there is a software which is supplied by e-commerce operator what happens you decide to download the software now if you download the software it will automatically be triggering an equalization levy by saying that there is an e-commerce supply therefore there is an equalization levy of 2% payable by the foreign company then when you download it there is no question of custom duty because software anyway does not attack custom duty plus it is impossible to levy custom duty because there is no bill of entry or there is no custom station through which the goods enter the country the software goes through your network comes into your portal comes to your laptop and resides there so in the absence of a mechanism there is no question of levy and there is how judgments are exist including the tribal judge in the case of atul koshik where they said that you cannot levy a custom duty because it is impossible to levy a custom duty now igst on import of goods is connected with the levy of customs duty under section 12 so if customs duty cannot be levied can you levy igst on import of goods therefore if you say download of software is import of goods the igst is doubtful but if you say download of software is import of service then igst can be triggered so the foreign company is going to pay equalization levy and the recipient has to pay the igst on the supply of service as an import of service but what happens if it is a software that is supplied to an individual and not a business then the foreign company is supposed to pay oidr gst so the foreign company not only pays equalization levy but is also required to pay oidr gst at the rate of 18% on at the rate of 18% as far well as software is concerned now then the further issues people ask questions saying that whether value will include equalization levy or not so we are getting into unbridled litigation and thought process for a single software transaction software was always a subject matter litigation both in direct and indirect tax in the past i don't think there is any solace for the industry they still going to continue and then you have this question as to since section 1050 comes into force only from 1421 between that period can you say that income is taxable if income is taxable whether section 195 is apply, applicable because of section 916 amendments so i have to break my head on every aspect the person who buys the person who supplies all of them are in trouble in terms of understanding this particular legislation for a simple software next so let me let me make a little more legal can you say that equalization levy is valid now article 245 confers the power in the context of whether it is you it can have territorial extra territorial operations but can you have extra territorial legislation this is a famous uh, thought process of mr arvind dadar where he, he makes a distinction between extra territorial legislation and extra territorial operations you can have a law which can have an extra territorial operation but you cannot have an extra territorial legislation and then we have this article 246 which talks about uh, various subjects of taxation entry 82 is very very clear the scope of levy of income tax is quite clear and equalization levy is clearly not falling within the ambit of entry 82 and there are enough decisions on what is the scope of entry 82 including gems for and sun as it all even in the case of tcs it was deemed to be income tax and therefore that was why it was permitted whereas if you look at entry 97 any other item matter not enumerated in list 2 or list 3 including any tax not mentioned in this list but entry 97 is linked with article 246a and now article 248 Article 248 is now saying it is subject to 246A. What does it mean? Article 246A is the only article which deals with GST. So all supply of goods and services can be subject to GST only through Article 246A. If a particular subject matter is subject only to GST under Article 246A, then you cannot apply Article 248 and use your reservatory power and say that equalization levy can be imposed under 1897. So I have no doubt. that this equalization levy will go to courts it will be challenged on the ground of legislative competency where is your source of power as far as taxing is concerned and that question can be a big debate even though the revenue might say we have enough power under 1997 you have to then look at what is the effect of the amendment to article 240 of the 101st constitution amendment act earlier yes 1997 was quite wide but after 101st constitution amendment act it becomes very very difficult to say that entry 97 is a uh, 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 very is enough to levy and therefore finance act gives me all kinds of powers next so the legal question which i'm pegging is can there be a levy of equalization levy on a transaction which is already identified as a supply and subject to gst the parliament has already excised this option and said that this is a transaction which is a supply if it is uh, imported by a businessman let him pay a uh, gst and reverse charge mechanism if it is imported by an individual let the foreign company pay in india 
Therefore, the foreign company is already paying GST on this transaction. Can you levy equalized levy, which is also on the same transaction? If supply of goods from a foreign country is not subject to tax in India, merely because it is affected through e-commerce, can you treat it differentially? Can e can an uh, can an e-commerce transaction trigger a levy? Can Parliament impose EL over and above GST? Therefore, these are very critical questions, legal questions, which will which will be debated in the next uh, uh, few months or years before the courts. And again, the question would be on the entire consideration. If you are collecting GST, can you again subject the same consideration equalization levy again? And is targeting an Indian customer sufficient territorial nexus? Does India have the jurisdiction to say that we can tax you because you are taxing, you are targeting a particular customer? That is that enough territorial nexus? Would it stand the scrutiny of law or the courts? Next. This is one side. But what is the approach of Uni OECD is also very interesting. They said we'll 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 release, we'll release this unified approach, you know, paper, where they said our objection is to arrive at a solution, eliminate disputes, dispel with uncertainty, balance con all concerns, and recognize taxing rights of marketing jurisdiction. Fantastic. So recognition of taxing rights is clearly in the agenda. But what came out next? What came out was. Yes, there is a new nexus depending on, in, 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 we, we can really recognize that you have taxing rights. But then, what the OECD in the unified approach said that when it comes to profit attribution, the solution proposed is some kind of a deemed residual profit, which will be allocated to market jurisdictions using a formal-like approach. And that by itself may not gain acceptance amongst all countries. Because many countries are likely to say, look, you give me a taxing right. But what is the purpose if the amount of profits available to tax is negligible? It is insignificant. Next. Allocation of profits to market jurisdiction through a residual methodology may not be a solution which will easily find acceptance. And then a lot of terminologies by itself. What is routine profit? What is non-routine profits? Allocation of non-routine residual profits would, be, would not meet the objective of pillar one which is great based on creating a new nexus based on SCP and users. Next, I'll give an example for this. Next. Let me, let's imagine this. I'm downloading music content. The service provider receives fees or charges online. Now, what are his costs? He would probably, there'll be an element of royalty. There'll be some kind of technology. There'll be some kind of storage. There'll be some kind of uh, streaming of content and various other costs for running the business. Now, the entire supply chain is eliminated due to B2C transaction. Now, how much of the profit made by the company is routine and non-routine? Can profits attributable to market jurisdiction also have the character of routine profits given the new equation? Can you now say that given the fact that you are giving taxing rights to market jurisdictions, the profits that you are allowing me tax is also routine profits and not non-routine profits. And in the, in the brick and mortar regime or in the physical world, where there, was there something called as a routine, non-routine profits for the same supply of uh, music? So these are very, very critical questions which countries are asking in terms of taxing jurisdiction. Next. Now, I have some solutions because if you there's no point in criticizing something unless you're able to offer a practical solution. I have two solutions for taxing the digital economy. I'm not too happy with the equalization really because that is a, a over-encompassing and very wide kind of a which, which, will, which will have its own uh, challenges. I'm looking at, yes, there are businesses which are getting out of taxation because of escaping the physical test. And instead of mind-boggling litigation on what is physical, what is not physical, what is metaphysical, what is digital, what is P, what is Google decision, what is all those principles. Let's look at whether we can bring in a new concept of presumptive taxation. We have enough of presumptive taxation. Why can't we get like this of, you know, oil rig and all this? We have so many kinds of presumptive taxation all in our country. We can define a digital business. I have a new definition where we can say that the activity of supply of goods or services over the internet or electronic network, either directly or through an online platform or through any other technology-based mechanism and shall include supply of digital goods or digital services, digital data storage, provision of data or information retrievable or otherwise in electronic form. So kind of confine the transaction to the digital economy and then say tax would be on the deemed income, which would be a specified percentage of payment. So it must be an income tax. It must be an income tax on the deemed income and make it as a percentage. Obviously, it cannot be 2% because you're looking at profits which are embedded in the transaction. Probably a very small, minuscule percentage for starters. That would be the tax on the deemed income. And there are two ways. You can say the foreign company can obtain registration in India and pay this tax. 
if you feel that enforcement challenges are there, jurisdiction challenges are there, ensure that the bank or the payment the gateway or the institution makes the tax. So there is a remittance mechanism. So at the time of remittance itself, the bank is responsible for paying the tax on behalf of the foreign supplier. Thereby, you also bring some kind of level playing field through a clear mechanism rather than a very vague mechanism. This is one option. The second option, next. We can look at how the FAR principles can become FARE. We can elaborate and, and, and further discuss on what is called as a theory of apportionment. So once you recognize that a new kind of PE or a connection is created, let us say digital PE, then FAR will have to have new meanings. Function should cover access and penetration in the market. Assets deployed should cover the website, the AI solutions, the technology platforms that are used in the transaction delivery instead of physical location. Risk, whatever is inherent to digital business, the risks are very different from a digital and a physical business. Privacy issues are there, security issues are there, vulnerability of data is there. All that will have to be given adequate weightage. And then from far, you move to FARE, where you add another element called as E, and that would be an economic presence. There has to be a suitable weightage which will have to be determined based on thresholds in terms of sales or volume. So I'm, I've recommended two solutions to look at taxation digital economy. One through present taxation, and another is an apportionment based on what I call as fair instead of far. Next. This comes to my last slide so that I've given some time for question and answers which have come in. What is going to happen right now is that the equalization levy of India by 2020 would inspire many other countries. So there'll be many countries who should probably take the route of India and would go further in terms of this kind of a levy. But going forward in the digital highway, we'll, we may have virtual malls. Why? Because now, so COVID has ensured that you may not open a mall for a long time. But at the same time, consumer demand does exist after some point of time. So there are already more virtual malls where you can visualize and use you know, augmented reality and then see whether you can play, you can look at the furniture, place the furniture in the room that you've created for your own uh, house and see whether the, the uh, colors match and the size match, et cetera, and look at the purchases. So there, is no, there will not be any more uh, look and feel, touch and feel requirements. Everything could be available virtually. There would be increased usage of robotics and automated equipment and therefore MasterCard decision will again come into play. And if you know that they are ruling in MasterCard, which, uh, which virtually said there is every possibility for PE, but virtually they said that the processor, the automated processor by itself creates a, a PE. Then what will happen to virtual consulting? If you look at the Clifford Chance decision, the view of the court was that uh, let's look at the number of uh, days, man days spent by the uh, concerned person and then just determine whether uh, personal PE has been created for the purpose of taxation. Now it is possible that you can do consulting through virtual format. You may not be required to come to a particular jurisdiction. So, so what will happen to Clifford Chance decision? How do you determine number of days present in India for determining status when the entire work can be done virtually? There'll be new nexus theories. In the Google case, there was this reference to naval cord. Would there be a naval cord principle or an invisible connect principle? Then marketing intangible in the digital world. See, unlike uh, the decisions in the marketable intangible in the context of uh, the other uh, products in the uh, earlier regime, in the, in the uh, pre-digital world, in the digital world, what is really a marketable intangible? Facebook doesn't create a brand on its own. We contribute to Facebook's marketing. Every person gives his ideas, so on, so Facebook, LinkedIn, etc., or talks about his post. So the more and more a per, the consumer participates in the marketing, the company doesn't incur anything to create intangibles. The intangibles are created by the consumer. So how do you deal with that kind of situation? And then comes the bigger question as to how do you attribute profits? And then future will definitely go into cryptocurrency. RBI did uh, some kind of banning and uh, circular was issued in the context of uh, whether uh, bitcoins can be uh, dealt with and prohibited and supreme court came with a brilliant judgment and struck down that circular and that supreme court judgment is a treatise by itself to read but future will happen is that the, if you don't regulate cryptocurrency cryptocurrency would be the cash economy in the digital world if india was trying to go digital to prevent tax evasion if india was trying to go more and more digital to ensure that uh, black money creation does not exist the whole purpose would not be served because in the digital world, it, it can very well happen in, in, uh, through a cryptocurrency, which may not come in the radar at all. Therefore, the ideal way is to look at whether country, India should look at maybe we can issue a digital currency. Going forward, instead of completely banning and prohibiting this, we should come with an alternative. Just like how we move to payment uh, mechanism through, or through wallets, we'll have to go and generate, RBA should actually issue a digital currency going forward. 
otherwise we will still have this controversy with reference to cryptocurrencies so these are some of my thoughts as far as digital economy is concerned i'll go to the last slide to uh, to leave you with a quote next this man is still relevant albert einstein is still relevant where he says that we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking which we used when we created them it requires a completely different approach you cannot solve any of the problems if you still think like before you have to think differently these are different times and as i said we are thrust into the digital world even though many of us could, many many could, may not be ready and therefore we have no choice but to embrace this world use it effectively and also see how uh, legitimate revenues are not lost at the same time aggressive uh, tax positions are not taken to kill this particular economy that uh, completes my presentation between 11 to 1220 i thank the audience for a very patient hearing next 10 minutes i will do it for uh, q and a and if one of the moderators can take over i'll answer the questions to the extent possible hello yeah uh, mr vaiteshwaran thank you very much we have heard you during uh, the you know peace time speaker but during the war time speaker also we have heard you and i think so uh, both uh, your avatars were excellent uh, thank you very much for your detailed presentation and i would request uh, either ganesh and mandar one by one to take over the questions thank you very much thank you vaidhi sir uh, there are a couple of questions on indirect tax front which i would be uh, asking to you and thereafter probably ganesh will take up some of the questions from the direct tax front please so as regards the indirect tax front the first question is that in case of a, a it software companies generally the model is that there are certain onshore activities happening and there are certain offshore activities happening and for carrying out the activities abroad there are certain uh, branches which are set up by those it companies abroad and whenever the foreign client pays the money the payment is basically made to the indian branch and uh, indian branch in in some cases remit certain part of an expenditure to the foreign branches we have a clause under the in uh, igst act which says that ki the transaction between the two distinct entities or two branches of the same entity cannot be regarded for the purpose of counting the export so what would be your view whether such kind of a transaction would constitute an export in the hands of an it company see i would answer this in in uh, three segments first is the i have my uh, doubts on whether uh, the provision which seeks to impose an igst on export itself is legal because if you go into your uh, the constitutional mandate uh, through uh, interstate supply only a, in, a transaction in the course of import was deemed to be an interstate supply so how does a charging right come through section 16 of the igst act let me that i'll park that aspect coming back to a typical question when there is a transaction between a branch in india and, and a head office in india and a branch in uk or us as the case may be the definition of export of service in terms of section 26 says that it is not a export of service and then of course they tried to sort out through an exemption notification but the point remains is you have to go back to a very old case law in the sales tax uh, it's a coal related case law where the supreme court observed an export means a transaction between two termini and what export postulates is that something moves from one termini to another termini the same principle was adopted in the microsoft case in the service tax regime where if something happens between one termini to another termini and the other termini is located outside india it has the character of export so when it has a character of export you cannot have an artificial definition which ignores the character and says branch to office is not export therefore there is a very significant uh, legal uh, position which you can take in the context of that okay uh, the next question is that uh, in case of import of a software uh in there are certain elements which are to be paid by way of a royalty to the persons who is located abroad so whether this particular royalty would be considered as a part of a valuation for custom purpose or there will be a, a payment a rcm liability payable on that particular under the igst see again um, this becomes a very important question for software if you are download if you are getting a software in a box let us say you are filing a physical bill of entry you are filing a bill of entry online and you take the physical uh, delivery of that particular box or a software then it is treated as goods for the purpose of customs but there is no levy of customs duty but if there is because it is exemption but even though custom duty exemption is there there is a possibility of an igst trigger because of the proviso to section 5 and there can be an igst levy by treating it as import of goods now at the same time instead of down, instead of doing in the physical format if you decide to go to the get the e license and then you go to the server and he gives you a key 
and using the key, you download the software into your uh, laptop or your computer. The decision of the Atul Kaushik is very, very clear by saying that there is no import for the purpose of levy of custom duty because there is no mechanism to taxes. They apply the cinema society principle because there is no mechanism to taxes, this cannot be taxed. Now, if you cannot levy custom duty in section 12, then the IGST on goods also cannot be levied. So that becomes an interesting question. If you, if you treat as import of goods as far as download of software is concerned, you may end up paying nothing. But if you treat as import of service, then the reverse charge mechanism will automatically trigger and you have this uh, software related uh, IGST rate of 18% you have to pay. So even though you may call it royalty, you may call it technical fee, or you may call it uh, right to the software or whatever it is, as far as law is concerned, they've covered permanent temporary and everything. So the distinction between copyright and copyright article is all diluted as far as the taxable and taxing entry is concerned. So if you treat it as a service, you will definitely get hit by 18%. But if you treat it as goods, there is a possibility if you can look at Atul Koshi. Okay. Uh, there is this last question from an indirect perspective. In case of uh, uh, educational institution, when they are importing certain journals and periodicals, uh, they, some exemptions have been given to them. Uh, uh, by virtue of uh, certain provisions of the exemption notification. So the question is whether the e-books can also be considered into that exemption to treat it as a uh, journals and periodicals. <laughs> this is going because to there is no that. definition of a journals and periodicals. Agreed, agreed. You, you will have to then interpret that the journal also includes e-journal and things like that or whether journal can become content or not can be a question. Now, uh, there is an interesting decision uh, in the context of uh, uh, custom duty. If you go back to the first principles which came in, in the context of technology, that was the Associated Simmons case. In the Associated Simmons case, what happened was uh, there was an import of technical drawings. So the company had imported technical drawings and then that drawings was put into a floppy drive and declared as a commodity for import with the value of $1. The customs authorities said that no, the floppy is not the item involved. The content is what is the item involved and therefore the content should be taxed at a much higher rate because you're paying a huge figure to the foreign company. There the Supreme Court said that technical drawings put in a media take the character of goods. So now the question would be whether e-journals, you can apply this kind of principle and then say e-journal is the same as journals or not. But harmonious interpretation, just because the mode of mechanism changes, you cannot change the taxability is one question. Customs is different because point of import was required. That is why I took that particular view as far as Atul uh, Kaushik is concerned. But when you're looking at an exemption, you can very well say that the intention of the legislature cannot be that the physical books will be exempted, but e-books will not be exempted because that goes against the philosophy of the government. Okay. There is one incidental question, extension of this. There are certain educational institutions which are probably in the medical fields, which have their uh, colleges also and which have their research labs also. So the same uh, uh, content which the educational institution is using is also used for the research purpose. So would it make any difference? Would it would it take it outside the purview pur pur of an exemption merely because those particular journals are used not by not merely by the educational institution but also by their research wing? But the exemption is confined to the educational institution. So the way the language is, you must first yeah. fulfill the criteria. Of, if you meet that criteria, then the exemption automatically applies in all okay. cases. So even if it is used for the subsequent other purposes also, so long as it is used for the, the educational purpose, it should be allowed. Yes. Okay. Uh, Ganesh, any questions from your end? Yeah. Um, Mr. Vaitishiran, it was a very fantastic presentation. Yeah, I enjoyed it thoroughly. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can yeah, hear yeah. you. Please go so there, as expected, there are a lot of questions uh, on equalization levy, very little on the digital taxation generally. Uh, I will try and uh, face out my questions from the general to the specific, so that uh, we get a flow in our uh, uh, in our questions as far as possible. So the first question is like <laughs> the first question is whether what, what you you have seen the digital taxation being happening across the world. Is there any right. common principle underlying these uh, the mode of taxation in various countries? Well. Uh... I did tremendous amount of research uh, for my book and what I found out was the overall objective in every country is that first, there is some kind of an assumption that we are losing significant money. So all countries go on the presumption that these uh, digital giants are not paying any kind of tax in their jurisdictions. So once they come to that conclusion, then the levy is structured based on whom they are targeting. If they're looking at, uh, if you look at GAFA of France, or if you look at uh, the Italian uh, digital uh, service tax, if you look at all of them, you're looking at specifically 
whom they can see as players in the market and they tune their definitions to cover it but i like the us digital goods and services tax is much more structured because it seems to focus on digital content it is focusing on digital aspect of the business of the of the uh, the goods rather than all goods which are supplied to digitally so each country has looked at the medium rather than the entire nature of transaction see i am fully i am aware that there there is a clear distinction between a digital transaction and a digital medium used to a normal transaction so if something is just the facilitator that should not convert it into an e-commerce supply as to what you are looking at okay uh, thank you the next question is do you think india can survive a tax like this and attract economic activity <laughs> well uh, we, we we don't know what all is going to come for later but uh, the very fact that uh, the bill got amended and uh, the act came in a span of 10 days when everybody was in their lockdown and uh, when we opened the uh, gazette copy we realized that what is the new section that is there which we never read in the bill that itself shows that uh, they are quite serious about how to go about this probably india has become uh, uh, india has probably wants to take a front row a, a forerunner kind of uh, thought process by uh, coming to the conclusion that the discussions in digital economy is not going anywhere and we may not uh, conclude with any kind of uh, effective taxation therefore till that we don't want to lose the revenue but uh, are we killing the golden goose is the key question you you, you want the egg but uh, but uh, are you in such an enthusiasm you the very wide definition of e-commerce supply i i would i would uh, uh, request that you know we make all kinds of represent and show that some kind of fine tuning has to be done if you want to have an equalization levy just like what you did in 2016 probably add two or three more transactions in the 2016 levy in terms of what you would think could cover it and rather than giving such a wide nature where even a normal transaction would come under equalization levy just imagine a situation like this a normal transaction can become an e-commerce supply because it becomes an e-commerce supply it will attract 2% tax in the hands of the foreign supplier and if income is going to be generated in that transaction and section 1050 comes into play what was their normal income tax also they won't collect they they may be worse off with equalization levy compared to this because 1050 has got a role to play so what will be the role to play it it will completely keep it out of taxation if it keeps it out of taxation you will always apply uh, various decisions to say one night charging mechanism and tds mechanism go together 195 will not apply therefore withholding will not apply all those disputes you know uh, the your uh, lily case and all that will come into play lily lily will come into play therefore it is important that government understand that e-commerce supply cannot be so wide you are already having oadr services for gst that gives you significant revenue 18% gst on many of the transaction you are getting through oadr strengthen your oadr elaborate more elaborate it and effectively collect gst on that particular transaction rather than going one step further to go to the equalization thank you you uh, dwelt upon the the various uh, union lists and the state lists and the concurrent lists and about the nature of the nature of the equalization levy uh, in your view uh, is it a direct tax or is it an indirect tax this is the first question the second is is it an income tax because when the equalization levy one was uh, introduced in 2016 the memorandum says it is a an attempt to tax the income of the non resident service providers so what is your view see that is why i refer to the sanyasi rao judgment in my presentation sanyasi rao is a very good reading uh, as far as uh, tcs is concerned when uh, tcs was brought in tax collection at source it almost had the character of a sales tax because it is collected on on the consideration of the supplier and therefore a view was expressed saying that is it legal does it go beyond entry 82 and therefore there is no power their supreme court has discussed the scope of entry 82 and then said look what tcs does is that they deem this to be an income they deem it to be an income tax and give it as a credit in the hands of the person who is ultimately going to pay income tax so because of those provisions only that levy survived whereas if you look at the equalization levy even though whatever they might have said in the uh, preamble or the budget uh, uh, speech or whatever it is you, you don't get your dta credit for equalization levy so there ends the matter as far as el is concerned and uh, going by the way they are looking at it it is definitely not in the scope of entry 82 if it is not in the scope of entry 82 then the only possibility is through entry 97 and that is where i made my point to say that entry 97 is no longer a omnibus window available after the 101st constitution amendment thank you one other question just come is between digital service tax or the equalization levy 
and the SEP, which is superior in terms of in terms of application from the government's perspective. I would feel that the equalization levy is attempted and structured as a temporary measure. And even if you look at the old pillar one, the idea was you will have a temporary measure with the commitment that the temporary measure will go away when you have a permanent uh, system in place. Therefore, SCP from 1-4-2022 and uh, business connection well established through those kind of definitions and probably some more clarity on what income is attributable, what property is attributable to taxation. Once that comes and stays in place, uh, EL will collapse. EL will have to have a natural debt. But we never know as far as India is concerned because if you remember, the Gulf surcharge that was imposed when the Gulf War was there continued for many, many years till it went away, the, even after the war got over. So for all you know, from a revenue perspective and given the COVID scenario where budgets are going to be a huge challenge and revenues are going to be a huge challenge, we don't know what can happen. I have a feeling it will might continue for some time, but uh, definitely it, it will collapse after a particular cutoff date. Thank you. The last general question is my own. You do you expect challenge to the equalization levy in un, under the WTO norms? Do you expect it to be a challenge as discriminatory or, and of not fulfilling the national treatment obligations of India? Definitely possible because uh, it is confined, it, it is targeting e-commerce supply of goods and services. You, you don't have this kind of a levy on any kind of a domestic transaction. But the only question would be is, as somebody asked an earlier question, does it have the character of indirect tax? Now, it is very difficult because there is no real definition of what is indirect tax and direct tax. We have a tax on income. And indirect tax, we have uh, presumed that it is something which is collected from the customer. In fact, there is one Supreme Court judgment which goes on to say, I'm not able to recall the name, that the ability to collect tax from the customer is not a statutory character or it is not flowing from the statute. It is more of a commercial character and people assume that you can be collecting from the customer and therefore it is indirect tax. That's what you learned in economics and taxation. But in reality, what is this nature of tax? Now, let's imagine a foreign company which is now subject to equalization. Now, they're going to raise a supply invoice for an e-commerce supply transaction. Why would they bear this tax? They would very much collect this tax from the customer. Now, if they go in, they are also going to be OADR services. Let us say it's a thousand dollar transaction, which is supplied to Ganesh or me as individuals for our own personal use. Now, OADR, they have to charge 18% GST and obtain registration in India. Now, GST law says valuation would include all taxes other than GST taxes. Therefore, should they include equalization levy in thousand dollars and then charge GST? Look at the kind of questions they'll have to answer. So they, it, it becomes a very difficult proposition for them to go ahead. So they'll simply include in the rate or simply include in the price and leave it to compliance in terms of domestic. Large, larger question would be, can you apply the agency principle for NRIs and make somebody else liable for this equalization levy? So when an e-commerce supply is being made by a foreign company, how are you going to enforce it? You've made a law. You've made them saying that go and pay this tax in India, go, go pay through the Chalans file quarterly, all that you've said. How are you going to enforce it if somebody says, no, I will not pay or somebody says that you don't even know that somebody has done an e-commerce supply. So, of course, you'll get the data from the internet service providers. You will collect from the ISP saying who allows you the IP data. You go to the bank transactions, you'll collect all this data. But it's going to take time and you're not able to enforce it. So, it's not easy to implement such an overreaching, overarching levy. You must, a, a levy is effective only if it is capable of effective enforcement. Otherwise, it, it will fail. Thank you. So I go to uh, more specific questions. What, what will be the consideration for levy of for the levy? Would it be gross or net of discount and GST? That question, I think uh, GST have already answered in the sense that uh, GST valuation mechanism is tricky. It, it was you wants you to lay, include the uh, GST portion, but for equalization purpose, the word used is consideration. Therefore, we will have to go back to fundamental principles of what would constitute consideration under the contract law. What, what is the interpretation of consumer for consideration in the context of inter intercontinental? And there are also judgments in, uh, in, uh, in the sales tax regime. In fact, this question came up in the context of works contracts, whether uh, VAT should be levied on the service tax portion. If works contract attracts service tax as well as VAT. So I've, in fact, uh, there's a tribal which I've, edition which I've won in AP where I've said that service tax is clearly on that consideration. VAT is separately on that consideration. You cannot levy VAT on the service tax portion. So all kind of mind-boggling interpretations will have to be done. 
and uh, i don't think a, a foreign company is going to be in that kind of uh, comfort to do so much of interpretation and what vision is about to change even if it is an imperative it's like this who is a big player and how desperate are you for buying that product or a service if somebody is a big player and you desperately need this commodity or service you will find probably all kinds of loading in that price in terms of taxes like the earlier days when software was there vat and service tax was merely imposed by everybody even though you could say that if vat is there service tax is not there so that kind of scenario is very much possible in a situation where you are desperate for the product and you have no choice but to go to the e-commerce supplier and you will face all kinds of overlapping of taxes one other question on consideration whether the consideration would be for the entire transaction what the customer pays or would it only cover the commission of the operator again very good question because they they bring two people in the same uh, bracket the e-commerce supplier is treated as the same as the e-commerce facilitator now a facilitator or platform has got a very limited revenue if that money doesn't belong to it only facilitates the transaction and though we will have to read consideration in so far as the platform or facilitator to say that that is his revenue consideration is what i receive what i am entitled to keep as my own therefore i don't have title to the money which i collect i have title only to the commission that i have therefore we will have to interpret that commission only attracts this particular claim what about the applicability of the levy where the sale contract is online but delivery is physical can i escape the levy and save because the delivery is physical the sale is gets completed only when the goods gets delivered so it is not an online sale but uh, it goes beyond no that the definition goes beyond it says supply of goods or services through or facilitated through the platform so even the physical element of a transaction facilitated through an e-commerce mechanism seems to get taxed which is which beats logic which which fundamentally beats logic because you you're going to have a thousand crore equipment which you could have signed through your uh, platform because you don't want an agency p creation you don't have a, you, you have your uh, mli coming into play and therefore you want to avoid all kinds of uh, signing of contract so all will have an impact what is the meaning of the term goods would it include actionable claims shares securities and other items or this is what this is what happens when you try to bring a new powerful all pervasive tax laws in a in a span of 7 days without any consultation without any discussion goods in the vat regime exclude actionable claims goods in the gst regime includes actionable claims goods is defined differently in the constitution sale of goods act treats goods differently without all that you just put the word goods and services and leave it for imagination of the uh, taxpayer and the tax department you are having mind boggling disputes i have a feeling that they will they, they should logically they should defer this effective date and then rethink this whole levy and then probably restructure it whereby some kind of sanity prevails instead of having such a over encompassing levy thank you would the levy include hiring of goods it says supply <laughs> supply right, It it says online sale, online uh, sale of goods. Ah, so and I, online I would, provision of services. Would it yeah, include, I, I, would include I, I, hire of goods? So the question is whether hiring is a service or a sale. So yeah. How much would you read uh, the Forty Six Amendment uh, into equalization? In fact, uh, let me tell you, there is a uh, judgment of the Supreme Court where uh, the Supreme Court has said, uh, "Geo, Geo Motors, or Geo something." Uh, where the supreme court has said that the 46th amendment should be confined only to entry 54 and should not be even read for entry tax they said you cannot even read the entry for the, the amendment for entry 51 you must confine it to geo millers you cannot read on, only for entry 54 therefore if 46th amendment cannot be read into anything except entry 54 which deals with uh, the old uh, stoyle sales tax how can you read the 46th amendment into the context of equalization levy Okay. Uh, what do you consider as more superior, the beat of the US vis-à-vis the equalization levy of India? Beat is even more difficult to understand. <laughs> equalization levy, at least you know the the English is reasonably uh, simple to understand. Beat requires tremendous arithmetic knowledge and uh, computation skills, and uh, sound knowledge of how profits are computed and a little bit of accounting back. Equalization levy is much more simple. I, I, in fact, BEAT has got a lot of literature as to saying why it's such a complicated legislation. 
so what uh, there are some uh, more elaborate questions uh, i'll take one or two of them just so yes. that uh, participants don't uh, uh, participants get the benefit so please bear with me please whether do. software embedded in a gps device can have equalization levy implications in this case the indian entity is manufacturing and selling gps device software for this device is the software for this device is the foreign holding company indian company gets access to software through online subscription so we are back to the same question in the sense that uh, you are getting access to use some element of the software which is required for your product manufacturing and uh, for that access you will probably pay certain fees or charges or whatever it is now they use the word goods or services so even if you say that that particular item which you are paying for does not fall within the ambit of goods then it could very well fall in the ambit of service because you are getting an access you are getting a right you are getting a right to use and if it is a service you will get still hit by it so the equalization levy is quite tricky thank you and the last question from my side will be whether equalization levy can is can apply for a principal to principal distribution of services between two non residents where one non resident appoints limited risk distributor that is another non resident to distribute its services in india through a resident distributor for example ad air time sale got your point we will have to read that uh, 165a subsection 2 in the context of specified circumstances because that is the only one that uh, triggers this uh, second clause this uh, one is to resident second one is to under specified circumstances specified circumstances talk about uh, advertisement and uh, data that is being sold so if we are able to gingerly walk through and fall and not fall in those two categories you will be out of it so one last question uh... in fact there is, there is another uh, interesting point uh, if you remember the vodafone judgment the uh, concurring judgment of uh, lord chief justice radhakrishnan where uh, in the context of 195 applicability to nr and nr his lordship observes that uh, how can there can be a tedious requirement for a transacting nr and nr when there is no territorial nexus to india of course that got subsequently uh, altered modified through various amendments both in section 9 and 195 but those amendments would be irrelevant in the context of equalization levy so in the absence of those amendments coming into the fray if you read the main provision of nr to nr the uh, the principles of justice rather than would still apply saying where is your territorial nexus for taxing this transaction and one last question from my side would be basically where there is a license of data between nr to nr whether it will get triggered for us as a specified circumstance for uh, triggering equalization levy debatable highly debatable there is no sale of data only a license yes, i know if you have to get out there you can say there is no sale of data but we are back to the same question as to what would constitute sale thank you sir thank you very much for answering the questions so candidly thank you uh, thank you vedish sharan ji thank you ganesh and thank you mandar uh, friends for the benefit uh, you know we uh, mr vaitish sharan has just authored this book on the same subject and it is available uh, on e platform through amazon so all of you all are requested to just go uh, and uh, download and uh, purchase that book for the benefit and now i would request uh, mihir seth to propose a vote of thanks thank you very much thank you sir mr vaitish varun i don't think so anybody could have enlightened us more on such complex topics in such a lucid manner well you systematically gone about giving us a 360 degree view of the entire digital economy first and then dissected every aspect of tax that could have been levied that could be thought about but i would take a cue from your fantastic quote of einstein that a creation of a problem mindset has to be different than solving them and what we find is that the resolution that is sought to be put forward by the fiscal authorities sometimes get into more complications than the problem that it identified with i am only reminded of a quote by palkiwala and it is so valid even today especially if you look at it from the equalization point of view equalization levy point of view and he said and i quote that we are living in times of such fiscal environment that your own shadow may leave you 
in the long hands of oppressive fiscal administration will not spare you. And as the world is evolving, there are new vistas and avenues of business. I believe fiscal administration is probably getting used to finding out new ways to see that how best they can earn their money. And maybe this is what they call as their social compulsion. Well, as we know, Herrick let us say that there is nothing as permanent as change, maybe 650 years back. But if he was alive today, and I'm sure after listening to your lecture, he would have said that there is nothing as permanent as change and tax today. Fantastic lecture. Thank you so much, Mr. Vaitha. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you Ganesh. Thank you, Man Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.